everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be exploring multiple linear regression in the R programming language. So what we're going to actually try and model and predict, um, let's assume that we're actually going to predict the happiness value of an individual. So what type of things do you think affect happiness in our everyday lives, okay? And you can of course be a little bit creative with this, okay? So let's assume that the first predictor that someone proposes is for example blood pressures. Not sure if that really does affect happiness or can help predict happiness, but let's assume that one assumes that it is. So what are they going to do? So they're going to sample those blood pressures from let's say 27 individuals and let's assume that they're sampling from a population whose mean is 122.5 with a standard deviation of 2.3 and again this is going to correspond to blood pressures. Now is that a good predictor for happiness? I don't know. That's not the question that I'm trying to answer here but nest but I'm generally trying to create a linear regression model that sort of in includes that predictor variable for which you're interested in including. The next variable that I'm interested in is going to be our hours of sleep. Now, the more you sleep, the happier you are. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Uh, but again, you're going to sample the same 27 individuals and record their sleep hours. Let's assume we're sampling from a distribution with mean 7.3 hours and a standard deviation of approximately 30 minutes. Um, well, not necessarily 30 minutes, but slightly less than that. Um, so this is going to be hours of sleep. So sleep hours. The next predictor, let's assume, is going to be our annual salary. Let's again assume that this is normally distributed. Again, same 27 individuals. Let's assume that the average population that we're sampling from is, again, $74,500 a year with an average uh, standard deviation of $3,400. So that's going to be your annual salary in thousands. All right. So are these three good predictors for predicting happiness? I don't know. We'll see. So the first thing that I need to do is introduce my residual term, my E term. Again, if we're assuming that our linear model is appropriate, then this should be normally distributed with a mean of zero and some standard deviation sigma. Let's pretend that that standard deviation is equal to 3.5. And now let us create our parameter or our parametric model. So this is going to be our linear model that we're trying to approximate, but we technically never do have in real life, okay? So y is gonna be equal to, let's pretend 23 plus 0 0.34 times x1 plus 7.5 times x2, and then lastly, negative 0.9 times x3 plus our error term e. So let's just sort of take a moment and think about what we're looking at here. So this is our beta 0, our beta 1, our beta 2, and our beta 3, and our error terms for our um, linear regression model. So for example, when our uh, blood pressure is equal to zero. That's not really realistic in this case, but let's pretend that it is. Um, and this is our sleep hours. So if we don't sleep, we have a zero blood pressure and we have zero annual salary. That means our initial happiness is 23. You can interpret that as you want. I'm just making up these numbers and variables just to sort of show you how to do a linear regression model in R. Okay, but those are the parameters, beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three, that we're going to be approximating uh, with some estimates called beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat, and beta three hat. Okay, so that is our predictor variables, x1, 2, and 3, and our response variable, y. So now let us see if we can calculate our estimates, our beta 0, 1, 2, 3 hats for our uh, linear regression model approximation. So the first thing that we need to do is generate our matrix x, which is going to be used in our generation of our solutions for beta. So if you remember that first uh, representation of x, the first thing that we have is a column of 1s, then x1, then x2, then x3, all the way down from the first element down to the nth element, right? So we need to create a vector of 1s. I'm going to call that vector of 1s, I'm going to call it v1s. So in order to create a vector of 1s or a vector of any repetition value, you're going to use the function rep of 1, that's the value that's going to repeat, and we want 27 of them. Now I'm going to construct my X matrix. So X is going to be equal to a matrix that's going to consist of the first column being V1S. The second column is going to be X1. The third column is going to be X2. And then the fourth column is going to be X3. The number of rows is going to be equal to the sample size in this case. So that's going to be equal to 27. The number of columns is going to be equal to the number of predictors plus 1 or the number of parameters in our model. So that's going to be equal to 4. And we're assigning these things by columns, not by rows. So by row, it should be equal to false. 
once you have your matrix defined, just take a look at this matrix just to make sure it looks okay. So we have a vector of ones, and then we have sample one, sample two, and sample three. Okay, notice 126, 7.5, 71 should be in the first cell of columns two, three, and four, which they are. So everything looks okay so far. Now the next thing that we need to figure out is the inverse of the matrix X transpose X. Now remember, this X matrix, once you do X transpose X, is typically highly ill-conditioned. In particular, the condition number is usually very, very large. So doing just the inverse of it with the base uh, language inverse methods is usually going to produce very inaccurate results. So approaching the inverse of X transpose X with the singular value decomposition is usually going to produce a so much more better result in terms of accuracy. So let's go ahead and calculate the SVD of X transpose X. So let's just do a quick review of the singular value decomposition of that matrix. So the singular value decomposition of X transpose X is going to be equal to a product of matrices where those matrices are U, D, and V transpose, where U and V are unitary matrices and D is a diagonal matrix with uh, the singular values on the primary diagonal. Now, what do I mean by unitary? So unitary matrices have the property that the determinant of them is equal to one, so they have, are, of course, invertible. Um, and the inverse of a unitary matrix is just equal to its transpose. So we usually know how to find transposes very, very easily via the T command. Um, so inverses of singular value decompositions are actually pretty easy because it just comes down to finding the inverse of that middle diagonal entry, which is just the reciprocal of those diagonal entries, right? So if you have diagonal entries of two and four, then the inverse of the diagonal matrix is just one half, one fourth. So it's very easy to do, right? And also keep in mind when we do do the inverse of this matrix, the order of the product is going to reverse. So it's going to be the inverse of V transpose times the inverse of D times the inverse of U. All right, so that's just some basics of SVDs, just in case you are not already aware of them. All right, so let's calculate the SVD decomposition of X. So that's going to be equal to SVD of X transpose X, I'm just going to call it. Um, and that's going to be used via the command SVD. And then it's going to be equal to the transpose of X times, now remember matrix multiplication in R is going to be percent star percent, um, then times X. So that's going to be the singular value decomposition of X transpose X. All right, so remember this function SVD returns three different structures to us, a vector D, a matrix U, and a matrix V, right? So let's just grab those individual components. So D is gonna be a diagonal matrix consisting of those values, so SVDX dollar sign D. And then U is gonna be equal to SDVX dollar sign U. And then V is gonna be equal to SDV x dollar sign v. So that's going to grab our diagonal matrix D, our matrix U, and our matrix V. Now let's just can calculate the condition number so you can actually see that the condition number is actually very, very large. You should be able to sort of get an idea of it just by looking at the diagonal matrix of our singular values. Notice that we do have a really large singular value of 554,000 and a really small singular value of 0 0.005. So when we do the maximum divided by the minimum, that condition number is definitely going to be very, very large. So let's just calculate that. So the K number, this is gonna be equal to the maximum value of our singular value decomposition singular values. So SVDX dollar sign D divided by the minimum of SVDX dollar sign D. So that's gonna be our condition number, which is definitely really, really big, right? So definitely if you're going to be using our base inverse method for calculating the inverse of X transpose X, you're probably gonna have a lot of errors. So definitely be careful with that. All right, so what is our beta solution? So remember, beta is gonna be equal to the inverse of X transpose X, and then times X transpose times Y, All right? So, Notice that this is gonna be our inverse of our singular value decomposition of X transpose X, so let's just do that. So it's gonna be equal to beta hat, I'm gonna call it. So beta hat is gonna be equal to, so what is the inverse of UDV transpose? So that's gonna be equal to the inverse of V transpose, which we know is just equal to V. Then it's gonna be the inverse of the diagonal matrix, so that's gonna be just the reciprocals of those diagonal entries. And then it's going to be the inverse of U, which we know is just equal to the transpose of U. 
and then we're going to be multiplying by the transpose of x, and then we're going to be multiplying by our, our response vector y. So as long as nothing is scary, that should be calculated in our beta hat approximations for our betas. Let's just actually take a quick look at these parameters, and let's actually compare to our original model. All right. So remember, for our original model, our intercept was equal to 23. We have an intercept of minus 24. They're pretty far away from each other, but you know that's just the properties of estimation, right? Sometimes we get very far off. Now notice for 0 0.34, 0 0.64, yeah, they're sort of close to each other. 7.5, 9.5, also close to each other, and negative 0.9 and negative 0.97, also pretty close to each other. So pretty much our intercept is the only one um, that has uh, the most error, at least in our approximations, but keep in mind our sample size was 27. Our error has a standard deviation of 3.5, which some people would argue is very large. Um, but if our standard error associated to our regression uh, intercept is large, then we should already know not to trust that estimate as closely as, for example, our estimates of beta 1, 2, and 3. All right, so those are our beta estimates. So what we can calculate now is our predicted values, our y hat values. So let's just go ahead and do that right quick. So our y hat values, so y hat, is going to be equal to, so beta hat 1. So this is going to be equal to the first value of the vector beta hat, which corresponds to beta 0, not beta 1. So be careful of that, right? Because in R, the indices of vectors start at 1, not 0, which if you're familiar with C++, C++ starts at 0. So maybe you see one of the advantages of C++ for programming, um, for example, in regression. But that's OK. As long as we keep track of things, then everything will be wonderful. So then it's going to be beta 1, so beta hat 1 which is going to be beta hat 2 in our vector. And then it's going to be multiplied by our first predictor values. And then plus beta hat 3 times x2. And then plus beta hat 4. And then times x3. Now again, remember this is beta hat 0, beta hat 1, beta hat 2, and beta hat 3. The actual symbolic beta hat 0, 1, 2, and 3. These vector positions are just referencing this particular vector here. So element 1, element 2, element 3, and element 4 of that vector, which we called beta hat. Right? So that is our y hat. So we should be able to calculate all of our usual metrics, for example, from our ANOVA table. So let's calculate all of our ANOVA metrics because then we can see if this model is actually appropriate for our data set. So how many predictors do we have? So we have three predictors. So let's just calculate that as P. And let's calculate our total sum of squares. So our total sum of squares, again, is going to be equal to the standard deviation of Y squared times the number of response values I have, which we know is 27, but I'm just going to do this length of Y minus 1. And that's going to be our total sum of squares. And then from our total sum of squares, we can also calculate our error sum of squares. So our error sum of squares is going to be equal to the sum of the squared residuals. So y minus y hat, the quantity squared. And that is going to help us get our model sum of squares, right? So let's just make sure this parentheses is actually correct. So it's the sum of the squared residuals, right? Oh yeah, that was going to be an error, so I'm glad I fixed that. Okay, so that's our error sum of squares, our total sum of squares, and now let's calculate our model sum of squares, so our SSM, which remember is just going to be equal to SST minus SSE. So once you have that, now you can calculate, for example, your mean square error for your model, so MSM. This is going to be equal to our SSM divided by the number of predictors that we have, and then our MSE is going to be equal to the SSE divided by the length of our vector, and then minus the number of predictors, minus 1. So that's our MSM, member MSE, and now we can calculate our F test statistic, F test statistic, which is going to be equal to what? So F stat is going to be equal to our MSM divided by our MSE. Okay, so our F stat is going to be equal to 9.28, so that appears to be significantly large. You can probably calculate your F critical value just to compare that to it, and let's just go ahead and do that, why not? So our F critical value is going to be equal to a quantile associated to the F distribution. Let's do 0 0.05 for our alpha value. Um, the number of predictors we have is going to be equal to P, and our next degrees of freedom is going to be M minus 1. 
right? So remember, just for a simple linear regression model, it's one comma v for the multiple linear regression model, regression model is going to be p times v, all right? So just make sure you do that correctly. And then this is going to be an upper tail test. The lower tail is going to be equal to false. That's our f critical value. So our f critical value is equal to 2.97. Our f stat is going to be 9.28. So remember what we're rejecting here. So that means we are rejecting the claim that um, beta 1 equals beta 2 equals beta 3 equals 0. Right? So we're rejecting the claim that our parameters are equal to zero, which means we have evidence to believe that our parameters are non-zero. That is, there our linear relationship definitely does appear to be appropriate, at least for our full model, at least, right? So that is our hypothesis test via the F approach. Now let us calculate the standard error associated to each of these metrics, since we haven't done that yet. So in order to calculate the standard error associated to each of our point estimates for our beta 0, 1, 2, and 3, we need to first calculate the variance covariance matrix. Okay, so our variance covariance matrix right? for standard error. That's its primary use. Right? So our variance covariance matrix, which I'm going to call VCV for our model, is going to be equal to sigma times, so let's just actually write this out, right? So variance of beta hat is going to be equal to sigma squared times x transpose x inverse, All right? So that is our variance covariance matrix. So again, we have this inverse of this x transpose x, which we've already calculated the inverse of via the singular value decomposition. So that is our x transpose x calculation there. So v inverse d transpose u. All right, so we can actually use that. And what is an approximation for sigma squared? So if you do remember, an unbiased estimator for sigma squared is actually precisely equal to the mean square error for a model, which we've already calculated in our ANOVA metrics. All right, so that's going to be a constant times a matrix. So that should give us a matrix, right? So remember, this is not a vector. It is a matrix. So VCVM should give you a four by four matrix or a p plus one by p plus one matrix. So where is our standard error? Our standard errors are gonna be located on the diagonals of this matrix, all right? So let's actually construct a standard error vector. So our standard error for our beta hat is gonna be equal to the square root of the diagonal entries of VCVM. All right, so that's our standard error. So let's just display that vector, so SE beta hat. So SE beta hat is not found because I didn't capitalize my E. And that is my um, standard error vector for beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Now remember when we are, were approximating our linear regression parameters, beta 0 had the largest differential between what we actually set it to be in our parametric model and the statistic for which it was being approximated by. Notice that our standard error is the largest in our beta 0 hat. So since we technically do not know what beta zero actually truly was when we were creating our data in practice. When we see this large standard of error, we should be able to think that, okay, if that is my standard error for beta zero, maybe I should not be trusting my beta zero estimate because my standard error is so high. So technically, even though we have a differential in our approximation, our standard error sort of says that, yes, we shouldn't trust it. So definitely all is well on the statistical end, right? So that's actually very, very good. The last thing that I want to briefly mention before we part ways today is to describe uh, how to calculate, for example, the correlation matrix of your predictors and your response variables. Because you know that if your correlation between your predictors is really, really large, then there's a high chance of collinearity between your prediction values, which definitely can throw your model off extremely. For example, if your blood pressure is affecting your sleep or your sleep is affecting your salary, if there's any inter any interaction between those terms, that definitely can cause problems in terms of your pre uh, prediction values because if one significantly changes, then the other also will significantly change, um, which sort of violates the independence assumption or ideal assumption for our predictor values, okay? So one of the good libraries to sort of display correlation matrices is a library known as CORRplot.
Okay, so that's a very good matrix that has a lot of uh, interesting visualizations for correlation matrices, right? So let's see if we can calculate a correlation matrix and let's do some visualization of that correlation matrix, right? So what I can do, so you already know how to take the correlation between data. So since we've already sort of displayed our data in terms of a matrix, and we did this way back in the day. Oh, we didn't do it, right? So what I can do is actually go ahead and create that data frame. So data is gonna be equal to data frame of y, x1, x2, and x3. So let's just go ahead and create um, that data set. All right, so that is all of our data. So x1, x2, x3, and y in column one. And let's actually go ahead and add some labels for this as well. So column names of data, this is going to be equal to, so our y value was what? So that was happiness. Um, our next value was blood pressure. Our next value was hours of sleep. And then lastly was our annual salary. All right. So those are our labels for each of the values, y, x1, x2, and x3. Once we have that, then we should be able to calculate the correlation of this matrix, right? And let's call that a correlation matrix. So R is going to be equal to the correlation of this data frame data, and that should give us a correlation matrix. Isn't that wonderful, right? And notice that the diagonals are equal to one because the correlation between a variable and itself is always equal to one. And notice that this matrix is definitely symmetric because the correlation of x, y and the correlation of y, x are always equal to each other, right? So although this is very beautiful, there are some visualizations that definitely make this a lot nicer. For example, one of them is gonna be core plot and we're gonna be plotting our correlation matrix R, and then our method can be one of various things, and you can sort of look at the documentation in case you're interested in, but one of the common ones is going to be the circle plot for core plots, and that pretty much gives us this. So the larger the circle, the closer it is, the R squared value to one, right? So large blue circle means close to one, large red circle means close to negative one, and the circles that sort of fade away um, into white, those are values for which there does not appear to be any correlation between those values. So definitely associated to happiness, happiness and annual salary, there does definitely appear to be a negative linear correlation um, between happiness and hours of sleep. There definitely appears to be a positive linearly linear correlation. And between happiness and blood pressure, there appears to be a weak positive correlation between them, as we pretty much were discussing when we originally did this problem. So those are some of the basics associated to multiple linear regression and how you can implement them in the R language. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.